Greetings. This is the seventh presentation in the course Self-Determination in the Post-Colonial World. And the topic for this session is land reform and indigenous land, particularly with a focus on Melanesia. The question, the central thematic question for this week is for students to try and appreciate, understand and explain themselves in their own words, how and why does Melanesian customary land pose such a challenge to liberal views of property rights, development and land reform. I hope you'll be able to get a fuller understanding of that by the end of this session. So in an overview again, I'm going to look at land modernism and tradition, um, land rights in the global context, then a little bit of in-depth in about customary land in Melanesia with some videos to explain it from Melanesians' point of view. And finally, to look at cumulative reform or neoliberal reform versus customary land, because there are these different um, uh, versions of land reform in the world, and we don't really understand them unless we see those different approaches to the same concept. I've got a little phrase here which tries to set out um, a key issue about land that after human beings, land is the most important resource we have, providing an ongoing and effectively limitless basis for food, shelter and medicine. A people which controls its own land and maintains a sound, a sound basis for self-determination. So in the first section, land, modernism and tradition. The first thing to notice here is that there's no real satisfactory or accepted general theory on land because the land tenure histories vary so greatly around the world, mainly because of the different uh, histories in colonization and feudalism and the intersections of feudalism and colonization. When we look at customary title in the Melanesian countries, that is to say in Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands, in Vanuatu, to some extent in some other countries like Fiji, Customary title belongs to almost all the families and clans, so the little people, as to say. Whereas in Europe these days, the idea of customary title mainly applies to a residual old landed aristocracy. So it's another example of why we have to be aware of Eurocentrism and not try and apply the conceptions based on European history to other countries. In many so-called settler colonies like Australia, Canada, the US, South Africa, dispossession of the original inhabitants was near complete and enforced by a highly commercialized tenure. So very particular histories there, which are quite different to most of Europe, where European, Europeans, for all of their colonial histories, they themselves have quite old cultures and their systems are much older than the so-called settler colonies. So land reform means different things in different historical contexts. Um, it can mean a redistributive form, an equitable redistribution of land to landless classes. It can mean a, the defence of popular mass customary title in areas like Melanesia. And it can mean in the neoliberal sense an accumulative reform which seeks to destroy non-commercial customary title. So in the more recent colonial experience, like that of Australia, for example, only a little over two centuries of experience, the colonists created land law, which was quite distinct to that of the mother country. That is to say, land law in Australia was innovative in colonial terms, and it wasn't simply borrowing on what had happened in Britain. In Australia, there was this invention of something which is called Torrens title. Um, it was the most highly commodified form of land title at that time and was later exported to the British colonies in Africa. Uh, the name comes from a, um, a British and Australian parliamentarian called Robert Torrens, who in the, the 1830s engaged in a debate with the British colonial office over the possible land rights of indigenous Australians. The colonial office was a little more inclined to have some sort of agreement with the indigenous population, whereas Torrens, as a local landowner, believed that they had none. And that's set out in Henry Reynolds' book, The Law of the Land, which is worth reading. So South Australia's Real Property Act of the mid 19th century, which is what is popularly known as the Torrens title system, comprises two elements. First of all, a central registration, a registry in the capital of the then colony or the state, 
and, and secondly, indefeasibility, a concept that means to extinguish customary claims. So it was created specifically on the one hand to organise titles in a more centralised bureaucratic way than the old European system where there were um, deeds of title, which the deeds themselves were valuable things. Um, and indefeasibility meant that once there was this registered title to land, no customary claim could overcome it, only fraud. So a very limited basis on which any customary law could come back to um, challenge this uh, Torrens title. And now this is different to Europe and old societies where customary law persists in certain respects. So there's a couple of background themes to the discussion of customary land and the neoliberal assault on customary land where it still exists. Um, the modernist preconceptions from European philosophies and uh, tradition itself and what tradition means still today in many more traditional societies. So modernist ideologies, for example, in particular liberalism, but also many currents of European socialism say that all tradition, the church, family, gender roles and so on is a hindrance to progress. But we have imperial modernism and egalitarian social tradition. So there are contradictions in this so-called polemic between modernism and tradition. Uh, modernist property rights have proven themselves far more effective at dispossession, for example. So liberal modernists argue to this day that patrilineal customary land ownership systems where they predominate, or they do predominate in many areas, although there are matrilineal systems, that these dispossess women, as if the liberal modernism was really about the, uh, the, the advancement of the rights of women. The East African experience showed modernist registration dispossessed women more conclusively than did the traditional systems. So uh, we have this background um, uh, conceptualization of tradition where European liberals and socialists alike often see customary systems um, as dysfunctional in modern or crowded circumstances. And that's an assumption which fed into the tragedy of the commons theory, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, to have an overview of what's going on in the world in terms of what's spoken of as land reform, we have this redistributive idea. So an equitable redistribution from land larger states, which accumulated particularly in colonial systems after the dispossession of indigenous people. Uh, the redistribution of some of that land to landless classes, what's called reforma agraria in Latin America, a very popular theme uh, incorporated in the political platforms of almost all um, parties, even conservative parties. Then we have the neoliberal adaptation of recent decades, uh, which I call an accumulative uh, land reform in an accumulative sense. It means the hyper commercialization of previous state, community or customary land um, in the name of capitalizing land and of course creating land as a commodity as liberalism tends to do with all um, property. And finally we have a restorative or defensive um, land reform which is about defending or restoring indigenous land whether under customary law as still exists in, in large parts of Melanesia or under some new form of legal title, some new modernist form of legal title as has been occurring in Venezuela and Australia for example where indigenous land was not recognised for a very long period of time. So to sum up on that, um, these are the three categories I'm, I'll be speaking about when I mention land reform. Defence or restoration of customary title, a title developed over millennia which enables community reproduction and thus substantial autonomy of those communities, including the source of their food supply and their housing and many other things. And redistributive land reform, which is a socially inclusive practice um, and the third one, an accumulative reform, the neoliberal one, which serves tiny investor groups and is the most antisocial. So the link here with self-determination is that um, if, we can, if we think of it in these terms, that a people which controls its own land maintains a sound basis for self-determination. That's very strongly rooted in the defence or restoration of customary title and to some extent in redistributive land reform because it's a socially inclusive practice. Here's this concept, the tragedy of the commons, which has been around for some time, um, articulated in contemporary times by a biologist called Garrett Hardin in the late 60s. Now, his ideas were picked up and adopted by the World Bank and other economic liberals, and they refer to this so-called tragedy in a lot of the um, ideological tracts about land and the need particularly to uh, capitalise or commercialise um, 
uh, still existing customary land or state or social land, the commons, basically. So the idea behind the Garrett Hardin World Bank um, concept is that um, there's this model of a rational herdsman who will take advantage of free for all. That is to say, if many people herding cattle or sheep uh, have access to a common property, they will take advantage of the fact that really there's no boundaries, there's no fences, there's no borders, and they will damage it. They will overgraze, they will overuse common property. There'll be spoilage from what they call non-angels, people who don't really see a strong social regulatory force there. And so this is an assumption that's built in there, as I said, also in many European socialist ideas, that the commons or what um, sometimes uh, classical Marxists call primitive communism only functions in special circumstances when there's limited populations. That is to say, in small scale operations, this works to um, benefit the community. It's a strong argument that's still pushed by liberals because they have the support of powerful interests like banking companies, uh, mining companies and so on. But it's been rejected by many commons analysts um, on this basis. And I've given you some references below to both sides of this, this uh, argument. Uh, the critics say that the commons were never really a free for all. There were unwritten rules. There was social regulation. If people were abusing their access to common property, um, there were some restorative measures or punitive measures there. The commons were too complex to define and usually closely regulated. This is also spoken of by Ivan Illich. They were closely regulated. There, on the other hand, was a tragedy of the enclosure, which involved mass dispossession. And you can see it in many historical circumstances, like the highland clearances in Scotland, for example, where many poor people were pushed off the land by big landowners and were forced to emigrate or um, otherwise find other ways of living. There is also this more meta narrative of development a modernist concept where development is seen as privatization or enclosure. Enclosure it was called two, three centuries ago, and these days development is really, um, or the neoliberal form of development is about um, privatization and private um, ownership, which drives uh, supposedly greater economic growth, which supposedly has a benefit for all. Okay, on to section two, where I want to look at land rights in a global context, and I'm going to use these three um, types of land reform, which I've mentioned before, and I've summarised at the bottom of this slide, to link to some extent to three different types of colonial experience. That is to say, where there had been complete land dispossession of original uh, peoples, of in indigenous peoples, in Latin America, for example, in Australia, um, or Alternatively, almost undisturbed customary tenure, as in the case of Melanesia, which I'll look at in some depth, particularly Papua New Guinea, um, or hybrids, uh, many parts of Asia and Africa where there's been partial dispossession or transformation of land title, but there still exists some forms of customary title where tribal peoples and other clans make use of common property. So that we get a broader perspective on this, let's look at redistributive land reform in Latin America before we come back later on to the Melanesian experience and the Papua New Guinea experience. In Latin America, where by and large there'd been a complete dispossession of indigenous people, not totally, but in most areas, um, there is this demand or demand arose even as far ago as the 19th century for reform agraria, for agrarian reform and to dismantle the big latifundias, the big land ownings that the colonial and the post-colonial elites set up. So historically, there'd been a number of attempts to carry out this sort of land reform. One of the famous ones was by Jacobo Arbonz in Guatemala, where there was a, an attempt to um, dismantle and redistribute land that was owned by the US United Fruit Company, which was in many Latin American countries. And that attempt at land reform was disrupted by a US-backed military coup in Guatemala in 1954. In Cuba, with the Cuban Revolution of 1959, there were a series of land reforms which were um, using a mechanism of placing a cap, that is to say a maximum amount of land holdings that any individual could own. Of course, after a while, companies tried to get around this type of cap, but nevertheless, the first cap that the Cuban Revolution imposed was a 400 
hectare cap, a maximum that any individual can own. That is quite a lot of land, 400 hectares. Really, it's a lot more than uh, is needed to feed any group of families. It's, it's to do with commercial agriculture and export-oriented agriculture. Later on, the Cuban reforms were more radical than that, but it's to see where the land reform began. Now, in response to that, Washington created this um, group called uh, an aid program called the Alliance for Progress because they saw that the Cuban Revolution, the land reforms were very popular and the, the threat of uh, replicating those, that revolutionary process in other Latin American countries was very strong. So the Alliance for Progress initiated by President J.F. Kennedy was including the idea of land reform and linking it into the Green Revolution, which was more a technological advance. It wasn't about redistribution of land. It wasn't a red revolution. The Green Revolution back in the 60s was supposedly about the use of modernist inputs like chemicals, fertilizer, and so on to get greater productivity out of land. But the idea of land reform was also included, nominally at least, in the US approach to things. But it fell into disrepute because really the practical alliances of Washington were with the, the old elites and they, many of them were big landowners and they were very hostile to the idea of any redistributive land reform. The more radical one um, later on was carried out in Chile under President Salvador Allende, where an 80 hectare cap was um, acted on. I say acted on because Allende was simply using the uh, the previous law set up by a Christian Democrat government to impose this maximum land holding there. And of course, as we know, Allende's government was later overthrown by a, another US-backed military coup. In other parts of Latin America, including Brazil, we have Via Campesina, Movimiento Sin Tierra, land reform groups, which were also promoting this idea of agrarian reform. And more recently in Bolivia, the Bolivian reforms of 2006, 2010 were a 5,000 hectare cap. So much more modest attempts at redistributing land, also making use of state land, but imposing some maximum limits on individual land holding. So you can see there's a, there's a strong tradition there. Let's look at um, in a, one of the examples in, in Chile where this was attempted in the early 70s. Now, the old Chilean land owning system meant that 80% of the land was in 7.5% of properties. Half a million peasants in a, in a relatively small country had no viable land at that time. And so they were sent to work as, as rural workers, workers on these big land holdings or they were driven to the cities. Even the conservative government of the early 60s enacted a land reform law, but it was rarely enforced. Now, the Christian Democrat government of the mid 60s promised to redistribute land to 100,000 families and their land reform law of, 18, of 1967 allowed expropriation of land, but less than a third of the large, large estates were affected. So in other words, the law promised more than it delivered. The new co cooperatives that were set up only benefited workers from the older states, not landless rural families. So in the next step, the popular unity government led by Allende in the early 70s simply continued with a Christian Democrat program. Uh, Allende promised to fulfill the social justice aims of the Christian Democrat agrarian reform while radicalizing its character. He even hired the former Minister of Agriculture under the Christian Democrat government, Jacques Chonchol, to carry out this program. So he it was a clever way of trying to get a consensus behind seeing through this particular land reform. However, this process also catalyzed Thomas or direct reclaiming of land by indigenous Mapuche groups backed by uh, left groups also. And there were something like 1700 of, of those Thomas effectively land invasions to preempt the normal legal process of redistribution there during the first 18 months. And that scared a lot of the middle class supporters of the popular unity land reform program. But recognize here that the Mapuche indigenous people had never stopped struggling for protection and return of their ancestral lands, whether under the colonial regimes or under the independent re regimes, which uh, began in the early 19th century. In the final stage of this, in many respects, the land reform was called a striking success. The Hacienda system was uh, dismantled effectively, but Allende would quickly be overthrown in a US-backed coup. 
So those who've looked back at this um, pointed out that land reform wasn't really in itself, it wasn't the basis for reaction. It was the Thomas, the takeovers of land, uh, the radical takeovers, because the the Mapuche people and the left groups that backed them knew that Allende wouldn't send in the police to repress those takeovers. So they preempted um, the more formal process there. And the Christian Democrats really, in particular, took up the defense of landed property. And that's what split a lot of the support that Allende, the Allende-led government had at that time. Allende recognized Mapuche land holdings, provided credit. He wrote off debts and annulled expropriations. Not all of the Mapuche demands were met, but it was said to be the only legislation in the history of Chile at that time favorable to the indigenous Mapuche people. So you notice here the limits of the US-led Alliance for Progress, although the, the US Alliance for Progress spoke of land reform, they certainly didn't support Chile. Indeed, Washington was behind the, the military coup which murdered the democratically elected president Salvador Allende and overthrow his government and imposed a military dictatorship for many years after that. If we turn to East Africa, we had a, uh, a land reform process, a neoliberal land reform, um, or the, the let's say the predecessor to neoliberal land reform in the late colonial and post-colonial period in East Africa. Remember, Britain had set itself up in the 19th century as the colonial power in East Africa, create, creating or reconstructing the, the states of Kenya, Uganda, for example. And in that process, in the late colonial period, um, they began to create these new forms of land tenure. Now, originally, the British um, had several forms of land acquisition. They would completely expropriate by military conquest. <clears throat> they would simply deny that the indigenous people's cultures had any right to land as the, the so-called uh, terra nullius, the empty land doctrine in Australia in the early 19th century, or they would engage in some sort of treaty arrangement as happened in New Zealand, where the Maori people were sufficiently united to carry out a war against British colonialism in the early 19th, the early 19th century. So in that case, there was a Waitangi Treaty in New Zealand, which reserved some native lands and rights to, uh, to lands and waters, for example. But that was the colonial approach to things, and that all changed with the creation of more accepted international law under the United Nations after the Second World War. So in this post-colonial period, um, after the Second World War, where the right to self-determination was accepted of um, indigenous peoples and uh, co colonized peoples, there was an adaptation to this uh, change in era. What I said was the late and post-colonial periods. It was said to secure agricultural productivity, so there was a utilitarian sort of rationale there, and the security of tenure for customary owners and small farmers, but it was about creating a new wave of modernist so-called land reform. In phase one, as book by Carol Dickerman and others pointed out in the late 80s, almost all the land registration systems introduced in colonial Africa before 1950 were primarily intended to secure European rights to land. In other words, the colonists simply created some new registration systems to appropriate land to the colonial classes themselves. Um, similarly, under the French in Algeria in the, in the 19th century, French laws dispossessed Algerians on public interest grounds and gave land over to colonists. Similarly, the Belgian colonists in Congo and Rwanda, Burundi, banned Africans from owning certain land. So this was an openly uh, racialized sort of law, which was simply uh, appropriating land for colonists without attempting a universal sort of process. However, in phase two, there was a more universal modernist process, which set up land registration for select groups of Africans. It was an attempt to co-opt elites basically into the colonial and post-colonial systems. It was a compromise, which was said to be the principal goal was said to be to assure Europeans exclusive agri access to agricultural land, but include some of these select group of Africans. And one of the, the flagship, I guess, of this sort of process was Kenya's Swinerton plan of the mid 1950s, which was about, uh, in the name of agricultural productivity, uh, granting access to registered land for Africans. That is to say, trying to dismantle the older customary system um, and to introduce um, African elites into the, the new registered system. 
It was said to provide greater security to landholders, freedom to transact land to serve as a basis for agricultural credit. Now, I mention this because those sort of modernist objectives are still the same ones you will see spoken of by the World Bank and other agencies that collaborate with the World Bank, the, uh, the Asian Development Bank, for example, some of the aid programs of the Western countries, the same sort of utilitarian benefits are suggested for modernist programs today. So historically, Kenya soon gained the greatest extent of registered land. Uh, the creation of freehold land continued under independence in 1963. So it was, in many respects, successfully inherited, that is to say, successfully in neoliberal terms by the new regime. In some respects, the, neo, the criticism of this sort of neocolonialism was that the elites, the new colonial elites, wanted to put themselves into the shoes of the colonial masters after independence. In the Sudan, during a large World Bank agricultural expansion program in the late 60s, all of the lands not registered were deemed under the Unregistered Lands Act to belong to the government. So there was a much more forcible uh, uh, program of modernization and registration. And in the Sudan, it was said to be the breakdown of traditional land rights and commercial, the introduction of commercial land crops like cotton into arid lands and the related desertification, which affected the uh, some of the migratory land rights that existed under customary systems that contributed to the development of serious conflict in the Darfur region later on, leading to, to mass killings. So looking back at this uh, East African registration process and the modernization debates, we've got an interesting polemic here from one of the colonial administrators, Jay Lawrence, who said that looking back at the process that it was really, in his view, an uneven sort of outcome. There were not desirable outcomes um, clearly, but he still called for registration, quote, when economic advantages justified it, unquote. That is, if there was a general demand for land registration, which is dubious, if the costs were low, and three, if there were likely gains in agricultural productivity. In other words, it wasn't simply a, a given, Lawrence acknowledged, that there would be greater agricultural productivity from the privatisation of what had been previously uh, common property. Now, the late Hastings Okoth Agendo, who became uh, the Dean of Law in Nairobi later on, was much more critical than this. He said any benefits of registration were outweighed by disadvantages, uh, that is to say, the redistribution of political power, the creation of economic disparities, a disequilibrium in social institutions, failures in social in rural credit, and a failure to improve agricultural productivity. He pointed out also that secondary owners didn't benefit, that less than 5% of the new landowners were women, um, and that the new regime of land registration created, quote, new forms of stratification and the status differentials amongst small farmers. Now, that sort of critique was carried on into the contemporary era too. But let's have a look at a brief video from the late Professor Hastings Okoth Agenda, where he points out how the British colonial approach to um, traditional land, um, how it was conceived of and what they proceeded to do in Kenya. And the key points to observe here are, I believe, in this short video, the longer ones online there and the addresses online there, how did the British view Kenyan or African traditional customary land? What did they not recognise about customary land? And in the customary Kenyan law, what was the main reason why land could not be sold outside the community? This is one of the key points of conflict between the British conceptualisation and the Kenyan conceptualisation at that time. What the British did here, they did in Australia, they did it in North America, they did it in South Africa. The notion that communities do not own land, because the concept of ownership under British law is private ownership, and therefore they don't understand how a whole community can own, and that if a community owns, they think that individuals have no rights against the community. Uh, what we had here was a situation where communities were themselves juridical persons and therefore controlled definite territories, determined access to, to land in those territories, the functions for which that access could be given, and the manner in which property rights were allocated, transferred, redistributed 
or otherwise uh, transmitted to, to uh, future generations. And one of the most important aspects of community land law or indigenous land law is that it protected the rights of the unborn as well as the rights of those who are living. And, and, and this, is, this is why property could not be sold or transferred outside the group. It could be sold or transferred within the group, but not outside the group, because if you transferred it outside the group, you would be expropriating the rights of, of future generations, and therefore they would not have no sustainable basis for livelihood for that reason. And therefore it was a very developed system of land law. <coughs> the British, of course, could not accept that. If they accepted that, they would not have had the power to allocate land, quote, legally. And therefore, the first thing they did was to say, these people don't understand what ownership is. Secondly, they are not capable of controlling land directly. And thirdly, they don't have the technology to develop it. And therefore, we are going to expropriate title, give it to settlers, pass laws that would enable the settlers to develop it whichever way they, they, they wanted it. And, and the way they dealt with occupation of communities or indigenous communities in areas that uh, that they did not need for purpose of settlement they put them under trust because they argued that um, the natives could not hold land as juridical persons so they put them under trust and the trust concept continued up to independence and in this country now land which is not registered in individual names is held by county councils as trustees, and that comes from the colonial concept that uh, communities cannot hold land directly. So, looking at the East African evidence in a little more detail, um, Okoth Agendo concluded that the benefits of land registration were out by, outweighed by specific disadvantages, uh, which he listed as the redistribution of political power, the creation of economic disparities, uh, the generation of a disequilibrium in social institutions, a failure to develop extension and rural credit, as had been promised, and also, as had been promised, a general failure to improve agricultural productivity. Now, the Swinnerton Plan's main theme was about improving agricultural productivity. How a productivity or agricultural productivity is measured is another question, which I'll come to a little bit later on, talking about Melanesian small farmers. Of the new registered landowners, less than 5% were women. The new land regime created new forms of stratification and status differentials amongst small farmers. Now, more recently, researchers from London's International Institute for Environment and Development have concluded in a similar way that the hoped for benefits of registration do not accrue automatically. And in some circumstances, the effects of registration may be the converse of those anticipated. Um, they looked back at the process in Kenya and said there was no significant correlation between registered land title and rural credit. There were negative repercussions on vulnerable groups and more generally land registration reinforced class and wealth differentiation. So in other words, the more recent uh, study by this London Institute uh, supported what uh, Hastings Okothagendo was saying back in the 80s. Okay, let's move on to customary land in Melanesia, which is looking at, as I said, a rather unique historical circumstance where particularly the, the larger countries of Melanesia, Papua New Guinea, then the Solomon Islands and Vanuatu, kept most of their customary tenure after independence, which came in the late 70s and uh, early 80s. These are the Melanesian islands you can see on the map there and Papua New Guinea is the largest of the Melanesian nations today with a population of about 8 million. Some of the writers on, on Melanesian land have echoed um, sayings from the African experience like Andrew Lacau back in the 90s was talking about the, the, the great resonance of the African saying that the land belongs to the few who are living, the many who are dead and the countless yet unborn. He said that was relevant and deep rooted. And you notice here there is a intergenerational or sustainable idea of land and what land represents. It is not simply a commodity for the current generation to be manipulated as any other commodity. That's an important theme. And it's a theme that lies behind the non-commercialization of traditional land, both in the African context and the Melanesian context. 
So what is customary land in Papua New Guinea and Melanesia more generally? Well, customary land systems in Papua New Guinea, I've written in my book, Land and Livelihoods in Papua New Guinea, is um, it varies because of the various uh, cultures in Papua New Guinea, but nevertheless, largely speaking, those systems were not distorted by feudalism. No large landowners developed, um, unlike the case in, in many European systems and a number of African systems too, either through indigenous processes or by collaboration with an emulation of the colonial powers. The main pressures on land tenure came from the need to coexist with their neighbours. So although these systems varied, they shared some common features and the dominant mode of land management in Papua New Guinea to this day remains that of a locally controlled oral tradition with authority in clan leaders. They have both patrilineal and matrilineal systems. Land rights and land use are administered by the communities themselves. It's not written down, it's not registered by the government in the capital city. Land itself is inalienable, that is to say it can't be sold or otherwise taken away from the communities. It was held in trust for future generations to ensure the livelihoods of future generations. And the late Bernard Narakobi wrote that land is the link between the earth and the sky, the sea and the clouds, the past and the future, because land is eternal, it is held in trust for succeeding generations. And that is why there is this general hostility where that concept is strong to the idea of selling off land because it represents the dispossession of future generations or children and grandchildren. Unwritten Papua New Guinea customary title is recognised in Papua New Guinea law and the constitution, unlike the case in Australia, for example, where after dispossession of Indigenous people, new formal titles have been created where there's been partial recognition of Indigenous rights there. So in this uh, Melanesian system in Papua New Guinea, I'm going to show this little video, an excerpt from a larger documentary, which some of us put together some years ago where three Papua New Guinea women speak about customary land. And the key points to observe here are um, this idea that the sense of belonging being in one's father's land, or in the case of the mother, mother's land, uh, Elizabeth Tongney, the second woman in this series, she is from East New Britain, which is a, uh, West New Britain, sorry, which is a matrilineal system. But the ideas are quite similar in the matrilineal as to the patrilineal systems. Um, there is also this idea that changes are being made to land law which are not, don't correspond to customary law and which people are not well aware of or they don't really understand what and why those changes are being made. And in a more optimistic, constructive way, there's this comment that if there are to be new laws, they should add value to the laws that previously exist in traditional society. Um, finally, particularly through Rosa Coyen, um, there's this idea that food production in the world is really something that's carried out largely by women. And we can see that's the case in Papua New Guinea, where the, the growth of food, but also the distribution of food in the roadside markets is something carried out by women. And that in a Melanesian sense, they don't see the need, or they don't want to see land as parcels to be sold off as commodities because they see it as deeply connected to communities and social existence and something that's linked to the, the ongoing existence and reproduction of those communities. So let's have a look at that short video. When they talked about how people came in and started acquiring land and the landowners sort of marginalised back without having a real sense of ownership of the land, it, I was really shocked about the situation because here in Papua New Guinea we still own the land no matter where we are and who we are. I'm a woman but I feel proud to say that when I go back to my father's village I, I am respected there because I'm from that area even though I'm married to another province. When I go back I still feel the sense of belonging in my father's land. In Papua New Guinea there are lots of changes that are happening in terms of uh, land laws that our people do not really understand about that they are made at some levels and they are not uh, people are not aware of and that these new laws uh, do not fall in place with the customary laws that we have in terms of land and uh, in terms of customary laws I, I believe uh, to make good laws in terms of land it should build or it should add value to the laws that we have in traditional society.
I understand um, without more food, about 85% of food, the world's food, um, on the table. And for PNG, if you take the PNG up the road, 85% of those people that sell us are women. When we look at it in a modern, modern context, um, land has been um, thought of as blocks of land, parcels of land that can be given away or traded for something. Women see land as, as a whole. Um, land culminates um, life, everything about life, the spirituality of land. Um, food comes from land, um, everything about life comes from the land. So women see this as a whole, um, not little portions that can be given away. Okay, so some uh, other general points about Papua New Guinea customary land. It is a clan-based system with family ownership and custodianship. That is to say, the clan leaders will allocate fam uh, land to families and to new families, including uh, for example, if there's marriage outside the clan, outside the, uh, the regional area, then land is allocated to that new family to make use of, to support their family and their children and so on. There are patrilineal and matrilineal clan systems depending on the region. In Papua New Guinea, the matrilineal areas are the, the islands and the, the farther eastern parts of Papua New Guinea. The, the patrilineal areas dominate, but there are some large matrilineal areas. It's based on an oral tradition and the disputes have been traditionally regulated by a local court system. That is to say, the, the central law in the capital recognises the unwritten oral tradition, the unwritten land law, which is administered locally. And that's often misunderstood as communal land in the way that the, the tragedy of the commons people talk about, that no one owns it, no one's responsible for it. No, there actually are strong uh, social regulation, customary regulation of those lands, and Jim Fingleton, a Australian anthropologist, is one of the people that's written about that. In the particular circumstances of Papua New Guinea, there is a land law which is developed around that customary law to recognise, for example, both customary and registered land. There is a small amount of registered land or land that's been alienated, that's been claimed by the state or was, was alienated during the colonial period. There is also a, uh, a couple of devices called, one called incorporated land groups, ILGs, which allows the clans to combine to um, carry out or support some projects across clans, for example. And that often uses a device called a lease lease back system, which is an unusual thing in the Papua New Guinea circumstance where there is effectively a leasing to the state and the state leases it back to the community to create a mechanism to allow land to be used by some outside body or investor body. And in that case, the state is acting as a type of guarantor without dismantling the, the customary land system. So here I, I want to make a point about the accommodation of new people and how the customary system is a very flexible one which can allow for changes such as uh, mixed race parents, um, migration, people moving from region to region, for example. Uh, in this particular case, how does a child of a migrant mixed race parent access land in Papua New Guinea? So in the circumstances, we have a mother that's come from patrilineal area to a matrilineal area where she doesn't have access to land, uh, nor does her husband, but through her husband's sister, uh, she and her mixed race child get access to land in a matrilineal system. So this is a circumstance where um, traditional systems, because of local knowledge, that the, the local clan leaders, in this case, the leading women, know who the families are and allocate land to them, they can easily recognize migration and mixed race families. But those things are not uh, easily done at all by centralized land registration databases. These people would certainly fall through the cracks of a of a centralised modernist system there. Moving to Vanuatu, one of the other Melanesian countries, uh, I want to look at the, the problems that have occurred after independence. Now, at independence in 1980 in uh, Vanuatu, all of the land was returned to indigenous landholding. That is to say, the, there were both British and French colonial um, rulers at that time there. 
Uh, but that land was restored to Vanuatu people after independence. But nevertheless, after independence, there was a huge amount of alienation of land on particularly the main island of Afate, which is mapped out here and shown in red, basically, since independence. In other words, in a very short time, in a little bit over three decades, most of the land on Vanuatu was alienated to uh, foreign owners, even though it had been reclaimed uh, shortly before. Now, that was because we have to understand the, the social circumstances here. The customary landowners are asset rich and cash poor people, often very vulnerable to cash offers. So whether it was through some conceptualized sale of land or lease of land, alienation can carry on there. And we'll look at that in a little bit more depth through this short video with one of the customary chiefs, Selwyn Garu, a few years ago, speaking about customary land in Vanuatu. So here's a short video. There's a longer version of it online. And the key points to observe here are, which of the social and business activities does he say seem compatible with customary land? Why does he say it's not possible to value land? And here we're going back to the intergenerational conceptualization of land here. Why does he see selling land as a crime? And what are the pressures on Vanuatu families to lease or sell land? You have traders sitting on the land, the customary land. You have the schools built on customary land. There's no problem with that. People allow, you know, leaders of customary, leaders of tribes of customary land, which is, which just kind of allow these things to happen on custom land and that's all. Because they are not something from afar. They are part, they are taken on and they are part of the people. Now, when you have something that, you know, businesses, investors coming in, they want to have, they want, they want the business where the community will not really be part of it. It's, it's theirs. It's not for the community and the tribes. Then I, I see why they, they want to lease because they don't want participation of the community. The, the cooperative society, for example, is for the community. So let's build it on this land. It's all for us. And, and, and you see, business for everybody has a place. Business for you alone not to all of us, then doesn't seem to have a place in custom. Because land is, land is not valued in money. Land is not money. You, you, uh, you can't value land with money. Land, as, as we always say, is life. And uh, if you want to value land, I mean, you imagine the many life that has been living off that land since time immemorial. Up to this time, and it's going to continue, and the value of all that life cannot be measured in money. Yeah. You, you just can't. And to, to really to, to, to sell land for money, to lease land for money, to exchange land for money, is for me a real crime. Because you are taking life, you, you are devaluing life. Mm. You saw the map, land is gone. A lot of land is going away. And it's going away very fast. We are trying to put a stop to it. But then the demand for cash, the demand for cash is such that it's not really, it's not, it's, it's, really, it's really a big challenge. We are fighting an uphill battle. You can't stop people from paying their school, you know, the kids' fees at school, the medical fees, and all the different other things, the clothes they wear and uh, the kerosene for the hurricane lamps and every, it's all money. Even though people may realize the importance of land, but the pressures on them is such that people somehow would be would, would continue to lease because there's no other option for them. Mm -hmm. Because we can do little markets, but people see trucks. People want to drive trucks. People people want to live in good houses. For me, it's always we can say as many things as we want. It boils down to the fact that we've got to look at the cash issue. How do you make these people have enough of what they want that they don't need to go to sell their land, to lease out their land? Now, I want to look at some of the economic evidence by which we can assess the utilitarian claims of neoliberal land reform or the demands for neoliberal land reform before we move on to the, the arguments about neoliberal land reform and restorative or preservative uh, land reform or protection of traditional 
tenure. Here's some example from the Papua New Guinea experience where a number of us carried out some studies um, in recent years. This is using evidence to assess modernist claims uh, and also reflecting on the, the competition between formal and informal sectors in rural Papua New Guinea where most families have land. Now this is a context which is rather distinct because in many countries where poor families don't have land, you don't have the same uh, constellation of outcomes in formal and informal sectors. It's often thought, for example, that women in the informal sector were always marginalised. But in Papua New Guinea, women selling fruit and vegetables by the side of the road can earn three to four times more than those in formal sector employment. Now notice the peculiar circumstances here. One, there is legally recognised customary land tenure and quite an even distribution of land. That's what backs up this outcome here. So the normal cliches about the informal sector and women don't apply in these sorts of circumstances. And in this table here, with formal sector incomes compared to the informal sector, um, we see some interesting outcomes. The top ones, the top few, are the formal sector. That is to say, basic wages at a certain time in uh, the sugar factory, in tuna factories, in the Ramu nickel mine, in chicken factory workers, private stores, um, also uh, private family businesses supplying oil palm or the fruit from oil palm to a big centralised mill. In the Mamalu's fruit income, which was women picking up spilled fruit for the big centralised uh, oil palm mills. And the national minimum wage, we see wages between 28 and perhaps 100 kina um, average weekly earnings there. But if we look at the informal sector based on various informal sector incomes um, carried out by Sawai and others between 124 and 158. And the surveys that I carried out with my friends um, in four provinces averaged uh, over several years, 144 to 230. You can see that the roadside sellers and most of the, the informal sector people were earning much more than the wage people in private business uh, there. So this is an outcome which is underwritten, as I said, by the fact that there is legally recognised and quite evenly distributed family land in these parts of the world. And uh, we're talking about, for the most part, families that are not in remote areas, but are close to rural main roads, for example. If we distill that into what I call hybrid livelihoods here, that is to say, where you look at some families who have lost all of their land and are dependent on um, some rents for the land that the family land that they've rented out and engaging in the formal sector, we see very limited um, annual incomes, in this case, eight and a half thousand kina per annum. We compare it to some basic rural um, families who have subsistence food, and that is to say the equivalent in production of what they would have to buy at market and some low uh, domestic market sales, they can earn a lot more than those that have rented out their land at the very low rural land rents. On the other hand, if we look at the good or superior hybrids there, that is to say landowners who are not just growing subsistence food, but engaging in local markets, engaging in to some extent in export crops as an additional add on, but not their main activity. Uh, engaging in some small business and in some cases also engaging in jobs, there's the potential there for land-owning families to earn a lot more in their hybrid livelihoods than those who simply abandon their land or rent it out and engage in the formal sector. So this is something peculiar to um, countries or regions or areas where there are uh, families who are taking advantage of the fact that they have a very valuable asset and are not uh, making unwise decisions, as was pointed out by Chief Selwyn in Vanuatu, to get rid of that land because they're desperate for some short-term cash. But those who hang on to their, their asset, uh, their very valuable asset there. Okay, let's move across to the, the last section, which is talking about neoliberal reform, accumulative reform versus customary land. In other words, a clash of these types of land rights or land reforms. The neoliberal response in these circumstances, and this comes from think tanks, for example, backed by banks and mining companies like the Australia's Centre for Independent Studies, um, 
they have statements coming from their specialists saying that communal ownership has not permitted any land to develop. It's the principal cause of poverty in Papua New Guinea. The endorsement of individual titles by traditional land owning communities is needed and where land reform has effectively led to individual land ownership, it has been successful in rapidly raising the living standards of rural communities. These are assertions. They don't really have substantial evidence to back them up. But nevertheless, they are repeated insistently, backed up by a lot of uh, Western land aid programs and uh, bank programs like World Bank and Asian Development Bank programs there. It's repeated by um, some intellectuals in developing countries like Hernan de Soto in Peru, uh, Charles Yala in Papua New Guinea, for example, repeat these sorts of things. But they're really not uh, assertions that are based on evidence about rural livelihoods, for example. It's also extended into leverage arguments there that, for example, in the Australian case where there's some recognition of Indigenous land, for example, in the Northern Territory, the late Helen Hughes said that aid should be made conditional or social services should be made conditional on the individualisation of customary tenure. So there's an additional conservative concept of mutual obligation to try and force poor people to lease out their land. In the Australian context, we've got this Centre for Independent Studies talking about individual property rights land ownership framework to um, enable Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders to develop enterprise and attract investment to create jobs. And it's essentially attempting to place pressure on uh, Indigenous communities in Australia to lease out land, which was only recognised in recent times, for example, under the 1976 Northern Territory Land Rights Act. In more general terms, we've got these revised modernist themes and I draw to your attention that the themes of the Swinerton plan in Kenya in the 1950s are really replicated in these arguments coming from the World Bank in the 1970s and 80s and into the 21st century, basically. At first, the World Bank was pressing for full commodification of existing customary land, but after there was a lot of resistance to that, because of course, where customary land exists, it's quite popular. Um, after that resistance, the World Bank shifted to advocacy of other market forms, rental, for example, and maintained an evolutionary approach. In other words, they preferred to have, they called it was the best option to have indefinite property rights, that is to say, selling of customary land. But in the meantime, they would look at um, market interventions which involved um, auxiliary markets, rents, leases, taxations, medium term leases, those sorts of things, and the so called building of local institutional capacity, which is really backed up by cadastral programs, mapping systems, which could create the basis for the future sale of customary land, for example. And that began with an important report by Klaus Deininger for the World Bank in 2003 called Land Policies for Growth and Poverty Reduction. In other words, the modernist idea that this um, commercialization of land, rather than benefiting simply the big powerful interests that would buy up that land, was somehow going to benefit poor people by poverty reduction programs. The other side, the defense of commons, the defense of traditional land has come from a number of quarters, including academic uh, organisations like the International Association for the Study of the Commons, and a number of writers there have said that this formal rights argument was has been not really grounded in local realities. It could often worsen the position of ordinary landowners, as we've pointed out before in the East African case and the Papua New Guinea case. The claims of increased tenure, security and rural credit have not been supported by evidence. So here's a number of references I've cited here for you to follow that up. Here's some of the principles and claims in this system. If we look in the customary system, we see a focus on sustainable family livelihoods, social inclusion, the concept of community controlled land and flexibility and adaptation to new circumstances. That is to say things like migration, mixed race families and so on. In the modernist system, we've seen a greater focus on individual appropriation with the claim that there's going to be greater security of title, but as I said, not much evidence to back that up. The principle of exclusive and exclusionary boundaries with the argument there's going to be improved agricultural activity, again, 
not with great evidence to back it up. And the problem here is the measurement is sometimes distorted by the fact that um, things like um, export earnings are included in national income figures, but uh, informal sectors are often not included properly or not counted properly in national income figures. The modernist principle of central regulation by the state is there um, to um, back up this idea of certainty of tenure and the claimed benefit was enhanced rural credit, but really that hasn't materialized and even the modernist systems these days recognize that um, there's not much evidence to back up the idea there's going to be improved rural credit. The idea was that if the land was privatized, then it could be used as collateral to get loans from banks. But in the circumstances of traditional land, the banks won't um, issue credit unless they can take the land if the, the loan is not being respected. Finally, the modernist principle of definitive rules-based system is there theoretically to improve the status of secondary rights holders, for example, women in patrilineal systems. Similarly, we don't see very strong evidence to support that, rather the converse as in the East African case. Again, the, the critical responses, and I've given some references here to the, um, the compilation of articles um, by Milder and Aidwatch in Defence of Customer Melanesian Land, um, the, an article published by the Australian Institute by Jim Fingleton, Privatising Land in the Pacific. In those cases, it's been pointed out that customary land is not a free for all, but rather a complex and flexible system of rights and obligations at individual clan and tribal levels, and a balance between group and individual rights and obligations with land ownership being held at the group level and land use exercised at the individual or household level. That is to say, the clan leaders allocate land to families and then when the families move on or pass on, it's reallocated to other families who are still part of that community and contributing to that community. Um, agricultural economist Mike Burke has pointed out that the production of all agricultural commodities by villages has expanded a lot and hasn't been counted properly in national income figures. That is to say, there's a substantial production both for subsistence and um, small scale uh, commerce in local communities that's not properly taken into account. The illustration I've given here below is you can see a small stall in rural Papua New Guinea in the north there in Madang province where it's only watermelons being sold, but the watermelons are being sold at about the equivalent of one day's wages for one melon. So you can see that there's a, a high value attached to um, simple fruits like watermelons there, and it's also therefore quite a lucrative business. So in summary, uh, land reform and indigenous land are people which control their own land and therefore their food supply, but also their dwelling space and medicines and so on. They maintain a sound basis for self-determination. There's the link between the control of land and self-determination. Land rights and land reform have these different meanings um, of restorative or defensive in the, in, the case of, in, in the case of maintaining customary or traditional land, but also the redistributive sense, which at least has a stronger social element where landless rural people gain access to the means for subsistence and reproducing their own families. Yet the accumulative form, the neoliberal form of so-called land reform is the least social of all of these types of land reform. The key elements of history which affect land tenure are really, has there been a feudal system where there's been a elite class which has monopolized land or not? Um, what's the colonial legacy? How has land tenure been affected by colonial history? What's the distribution of land in particular regions, for example? Now, modernist land reform, the neoliberal reform, has been very effective at dispossession. It's promised a lot, hasn't delivered on those promises. But some of the non-feudal traditional forms, for example, in Melanesia, are very resilient, sustainable, and highly egalitarian. So there's a great deal of resistance in those systems to this sort of modernist land reform. Colonial and neocolonial regimes, uh, more recent forms of colonization have developed or innovated in modernist land registration, but mainly to remove land from indigenous populations and while privatizing social also and, and state land in other cases. The tragedy of the commons ideas have been picked up and used in support of privatization and land titling, stressing individualization and, and markets. 
and later modernization arguments have argued from the Swinton Plan 2 to the World Bank that registration or mobilization of land for capitalization of land for uh, one, the security of tenure, two, the agricultural productivity, three, equity or capitalization, four, the benefit of women, and five, rural credit, all theoretical modernization arguments. Those claims have not been strongly backed by historical evidence and should be regarded in a far more critical sense. So finally, once again, I'll um, indicate just some further reading. There is a quite a good pamphlet by Oxfam and the Grow Collective, uh, a critique of what's called land grab this, these days in Southeast Asia and Papua New Guinea and Melanesia in under the guise in Papua New Guinea of special agricultural business leases where more than 5 million hectares were said to have been leased out in the early part of the 21st century. Most of them were declared illegal by the PNG Commission of Inquiry over 2011, 2014, but those land grabs continue. There is an indigenous uh, Papua New Guinea group called Act Now, which publishes a lot on these land grabs and on land registration. And there's also my book on the land and livelihoods in Papua New Guinea, which brings together a lot of this literature.